Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let me ask you a question. Where does the word pastor appear in the Bible? Is it first found in the Old Testament, or is the word pastor only found in the New Testament? And if it is in the New Testament, which book of the Bible is the word pastor found? Well, it's a little bit of a trick question because the word pastor is actually from the Latin for shepherd. And so from the original Greek, the word pastor does not appear in the Bible. You might find some translations that use the word pastor, but really it should be shepherd. And so the ESV version, the English Standard Version that we use, uses the word shepherd. Like in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, where it says, And he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, and evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. But pastor was used from the Latin, and so in the Western church, it has carried over to the United States. And so people call me pastor, which I probably prefer rather than being called shepherd. Pastors. What do we know about pastors? Well, let me share a couple of things with you here. First of all, I found that there's some interesting things when it comes to pastors. And this little list I have here are 13 things a pastor should never say to their congregation. Let me share a few with you. One, I'm thinking of quitting. I haven't decided. Pray for me. Say that once and the congregation is stunned. Say it twice and a group will rise up and make it a reality. Number two, I'm no theologian. Well, if you don't know the Bible, who is? The pastor must be the resident theologian of that congregation. Number three, God told me to tell you. And if you ever say that, the next words that come out of your mouth better be words of scripture. Number four, the board, elders, deacons, church council, we are in serious disagreement. Well, you never want to bring disagreement into a congregation. Number five, if you love Jesus, you will show up for the meeting at two o'clock Saturday night. That's really early in the morning. Okay, so those are a few of those fun little tidbits. There's a whole list of them. I only read a few, but you know, turn up bound is, a, is fair play, right? So just as pastors, you better not say certain things to your congregation. So here's a few things that a congregation or churchgoers should never say to their pastor. Here's the list. You can laugh if you want, but it's true. Okay. Number one, you can preach your way out of a paper bag. I never thought I preached in a paper bag. <laughs> Number two, we get it. We need to share the gospel. Can you preach about something else? Uh, well, that's not what Jesus said. Number three, I can't look at you when you preach because you're not wearing a robe or because you're wearing a clerical or because you're wearing a suit or because you're not wearing a tie. So I have all of those uh, various uh, dress wardrobes. So uh, I, I guess it just depends on my particular mood. Today, I'm, a, I'm in a clerical mood. Number four, we aren't going to be as close to you as our last pastor. Well, that's why he's the last pastor. You need to be engaging and share with your pastor. Number five, you obviously don't look at my tithe amount. This is similar to 
I pay your salary, which means you work for me. Here's another one. You can preach, but you're a crappy pastor. <laughs> can you say that in church? A crappy? I guess it can work the other way around too. You, you're a crappy pastor, but you can preach. Uh, I'm not sure which one would be better. Okay, so anyway, uh, I thought those would be kind of fun to share with you. Things pastors should never say to the congregation, things churchgoers should not say to a pastor. Well, the reason I'm sharing that with you today is because of just that idea of pastor or shepherd, as I said earlier. And really, these things I share with you are speaking about relationships. And so today, from our gospel lesson, we can see that there are some relationships that exist among sheep, among the under shepherd and the good shepherd. You know, it's actually kind of nice to be a sheep because then we get to be a part of God's flock. And we as God's sheep, we're all part of the same flock. God cares for each one of us just as much. So God does not play favorites. He doesn't like one sheep more than the other. In fact, only if a sheep should get lost would God leave behind the 99 to go and find that one lost sheep. And as sheep, we are cared for, and we are able to enjoy one another. Being a part of that same flock can be a wonderful thing because we dwell together and we share everything together. That's a wonderful blessing for us. So sheep have relationship with other sheep. And because we are in the same flock, we can enjoy that relationship with one another. We can look at each other and realize how God loves you, and so we can love one another. That's the relationship with sheep, both with God and with one another. But our scripture lesson also mentions another relationship, one who would come in and hurt the sheep. These and robbers would steal the sheep. And that is really the relationship that we have with sin, with the devil. They're constantly putting us at risk. And we must be aware of the spiritual warfare that goes on, that the devil loves nothing more than to damage our relationship and to deceive us, to lead us into temptation. He does all these things in order for us to scatter and to be led astray. We have to always be careful of that relationship that is there to confront us, the temptations that come our way. And so sheep, we have relationships with each other, with the shepherd, and with those things that would harm us. But then there's also a relationship that sheep have with the under shepherd. And so what is an under shepherd? Well, an under shepherd, first and foremost, serves under the good shepherd. We tend to think, well, the shepherd, the under shepherd, the pastor, is there to serve the people. And to an extent, that is true. But first and foremost, the under shepherd is to serve the good shepherd. And he serves under him and represents him. And so that is why the under shepherd, the pastor, must at times preach the law, at times confront people about sin, at times we we'll need to remind people that there is a need for confession and repentance, that there is consequences, that there are all kinds of things that we might be aware of that is harmful for our spiritual health or our faith or our relationships, our walk with God. That's what an under shepherd has responsibility to do for the good shepherd. And he also has then the responsibilities to pronounce the good news, 
to share God's forgiveness. So just as you confess your sins and I speak God's words of forgiveness, it's as if Christ himself spoke those to you to pronounce forgiveness, to pronounce and remind you of God's love, to encourage you in your walk in faith, to challenge you to grow and utilize your spiritual gifts, to be good stewards of your time and your talents and your treasures, to equip you for reaching out to your neighbors, to be a witness, to help you develop spiritual conversation skills, to help you and guide you along each way, be it from the time you are young to the time you are old. In between, it's always engaging you so that our Good Shepherd can care for you. And by serving the Good Shepherd, the Under Shepherd is there to serve you. And then there is the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is the best. What the sheep and what the under shepherd cannot do, only the good shepherd can do. What makes Jesus the good shepherd? Well, he says, I am the good shepherd. And what does he do? He does the one thing that none of us can do. He lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrificed himself upon the cross willingly taking our sin, willingly making it possible for us to have God's forgiveness freely. He laid down his life for our benefit, not for his own. He laid down his life so that we can be reconciled with one another and with himself and with God. He laid down his life for all the sins of the world so that even those who do not yet believe. They too have that gift of forgiveness and eternal life present and available for them because God has already done it. It is theirs for the receiving. And so we share our faith with others to tell them, receive this wonderful gift from God. It is there for you. There's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it because the good shepherd has laid down his life for you. And that good shepherd has the power to take up his life again. And so Jesus rose. He rose again from the grave on the third day. He rose again in victory. He rose again to show us that he is the Christ. He rose again to grant us the assurance that even though we shall die, we too shall rise and have a resurrection on the last day. We too have that eternal promise. And that is our comfort. That is our hope. That is what we look forward to. That is the assurance we have. That's what we celebrate as we gather as God's children. It is to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And this Easter season is a wonderful time for us to be able to do so. We have relationships as sheep with the under shepherd with the Good Shepherd. These are all wonderful relationships that we have from God. Earlier I shared with you some things that a pastor should never say to a congregation. One of them that I did not share with you was don't ever say in conclusion and finally five times because then it just tunes people out, and they're wrapping up. And so they suggest, just end your message in the name of Jesus, by his power, for his glory. Amen.